All right. Welcome to Live Science Dinosaur Edition. I'm Laura Gaggle. I'm a senior writer here at Live Science, and I'm here today with Kenneth Lacavara. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here, Laura. Great. Kenneth is the Dean of the School of Earth and Environment at Rowan University in New Jersey, and he's also the director of the Gene and Rick Edelman Fossil Park there. So, mm -hmm. Kenneth is here because he wrote this great book, Why Dinosaurs Matter, which is published by Ted and Simon and & Schuster. Mm -hmm. And we're actually doing a trivia slash giveaway today. So if you correctly answer this question, we will be choosing five winners at random from among the Facebook comments in this Facebook Live episode. And if you were one of those five people, you could receive a free signed copy um, of this book. We will send it to you. So make sure you get back to us when we ping you if you get the right answer. And uh, yes, so two of you will receive these two free copies of Why Dinosaurs Matter. If you correctly answer this trivia question, how do you escape from a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Hmm. So thank you for sending these, Ken. <laughs> sure. So just to start at the beginning, what is a dinosaur? How do we define them? Well, you know, I found that there's large-scale confusion over what is and isn't a dinosaur. And uh, a lot of times when I give talks, I, I, I give a little quiz and I put up a picture of a mosasaur, this big giant marine creature, and I ask, is that a dinosaur? And then I put up a picture of a, a pterosaur, a flying creature from the Mesozoic, is that a dinosaur? A crocodile, is that a dinosaur? And then I put up a picture of a little fuzzy penguin. <laughs> and the answers are, Mosasaurs, not dinosaurs. All the dinosaurs lived on land. A mosasaur is a marine reptile that lived along with the dinosaurs, but not a dinosaur. Pterosaurs, like pterodactyls that you see in all the children's books, not dinosaurs. Your children's books have lied to you. Oh, no. They're <laughs> reptiles, right? They are reptiles. They're flying reptiles. And then crocodiles are the closest living relatives today to dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs. And that little fuzzy penguin, that is a dinosaur. Penguins are dinosaurs. All birds are dinosaurs. And all birds are dinosaurs to the same degree that a T-Rex is a dinosaur, to a Stegosaurus is a dinosaur. They, if, if you're a dinosaur, that's a binary condition. You are one or you're not. And the reason that they're dinosaurs is they can trace their ancestry back to the very first dinosaur, just like all the others. And if you have the very first dinosaur for an ancestor, you're a dinosaur. Wow. <laughs> all right. So penguins are dinosaurs. Penguins are dinosaurs. I love it. <laughs> when people first started to discover dinosaurs, what did they think about them? Because today we know they probably had very complex behaviors, they mm -hmm. may have had super senses, yeah. some of them had feathers. That's right. Well, if you go way, way back, it seems that people were discovering dinosaurs in the Gobi Desert in the American West and other places. They didn't know what they were. And so humans did what humans do, which is they made up stories to explain what they were seeing. And so uh, Adrian Mayer has written a, a couple of great books uh, about the folk paleontology of ancient people. Uh, she ascribes the myth of the griffin, which has the, the head of an eagle and the body of a lion, to um, protoceratops in, in the Gobi Desert. Um, and so, you know, people made up myths to explain them, and then later on, um, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. dinosaur bones started to turn up in the forests around England. And the scientists at the time, they didn't really understand what they were, and so they thought they were giant uh, reptiles. Iguanodon was one of the first three found, and so they thought it was just this big lizard. And what did they think of dinosaurs? Like, did they think they were smart? Did they think they were kind of, like, not so very smart lizards? Well, they, uh, the person who gave dinosaurs their name, uh, Richard Owen, um, he described them as the crocodile lizards of the past. And so they thought they were just these big, plodding, indolent creatures, terribly stupid, you know, slow moving. And they, uh, you know, in his defense, uh, they didn't have a great fossil record at the time. They had very scant remains with which to work. But, you know, we've come a long way since those days. And now we think of dinosaurs as vigorous, active, very competent creatures, you know, creatures of consequence uh, in their landscape. So what time period are we talking about? When did the first dinosaur fossils start to show up in the modern period? The name dinosaur comes from uh, 1842, and in the, the 15 or so years before that, uh, the bones were turning up, uh, mostly in England. Um, and so that was really the, the era of discovery. And then the first really decent dinosaur skeleton shows up in 1858 wow. in, of all places, Haddonfield, New Jersey. 
Oh, that's where the state in which you teach. That's right, yeah, not, not very far from Rowan University. And so the, the first substantially complete dinosaur skeleton comes from southern New Jersey, and then the first tyrannosaur comes from southern New Jersey, uh, about a mile away from the Edelman Fossil Park. So southern New Jersey is really the birthplace of dinosaur paleontology. All right, so we can't <laughs> talk about dinosaurs without talking about Tyrannosaurus rex. Sure. I read in your book that T-Rex was first uncovered in 1902 in Montana. Mm -hmm. What have we learned about T-Rex? What makes T-Rex the king of all dinosaurs? Well, it's an amazing dinosaur. You know, um, the earliest dinosaurs discovered have the most fame, and I, I think that's because they've just been in pop culture longer than the others. But T-Rex is really deserving of that fame. It was huge. It was probably the, the biggest meat-eating meat -eating dinosaur, certainly the biggest one that we know about. Um, it seems to have had the most powerful bite ever possessed by a land animal. It seems to have had, uh, there are papers about the, you know, the sensory perceptions of T-Rex. Um, it seems to have had uh, eyes that were, you know, probably uh, more visually acute than hawks today. Wow. Great olfactory senses. It's controversial, but many papers think that T-Rex was really fast. There was a paper out this summer that said it was slow, but, I saw that. Um, but it, it, you know, I think most think that it was a pretty speedy uh, dinosaur. So, uh, and surprisingly, it's reasonable to think that T-Rex was also a feathered dinosaur. Oh, yes. You never see that in the Jurassic Park movie. You don't. And no one has recovered feathers from a T-Rex because to preserve big bones they need to be covered quickly by sand and sand isn't the right medium to, per, to preserve feathers but it's parsimonious to think so because we have relatives on one side of T-Rex like tiny little dinosaurs like Sinoceropteryx which are feathered and dinosaurs on the other side like birds so you would think that uh, T-Rex being in that group, probably that these dinosaurs got their feathers from a common ancestor, and that's also the common ancestor of T-Rex. That would make sense. Yeah, yeah so T-Rex was probably um, both terrifying and fancy. All right, <laughs> but he had such tiny little arms. Mm -hmm. what, why do we think that the arms were so small on T-Rex? Well, they were. We see the bones. They have these little uh, withered kind of you know, scrawny arms with these two little witchy fingers uh, sticking out there. And, you know, you can search online and you see lots of Internet memes uh, ridiculing the little, you know, Lilliputian arms of T-Rex. T-Rex can't put its hat on. If you're happy and you know it, oh, never mind. Or, you know, uh, T-Rex uh, sitting on a throne of sorts, unable to wipe its bum. <laughs> T-Rex can't do push-ups. Can't do push-ups, yeah. Um, but uh, oftentimes in evolution, what we see are, are trade-offs. And some trade-offs that appear to favor weaknesses really provide strengths in other areas. They could be strengths in, in the efficiency of the animal, or in T-Rex it might be something else. There's a paleontologist in Los Angeles, Michael Habib, who I think has um, a brilliant explanation for the biomechanics of T-Rex arms, which is that we know that T-Rex has the most powerful bite ever on a land animal. Yeah. To have a powerful bite, you need really big jaw muscles. To have really big jaw muscles, you need a really big skull. And if you're gonna have a really big heavy skull, you need really big neck muscles to hold up that head. Yes. And the neck muscles and the arm muscles compete for muscle attachment space in the shoulder. Oh, so that would make sense to have tiny arms. Yeah, so you're not going to be able to have that really big bite with a really big head and a really big neck if you also have really big arms. So those tiny little arms may have helped give rise to the most powerful bite ever on land that could crush a dinosaur skull with one bite. And I think that makes those arms a little less funny now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it that way. Yeah. You also mentioned if T-Rex had longer arms, what might a disadvantage have been? Well, with longer arms, um, uh, this again is Michael Habib's uh, work. And you know, looking at longer arm predators like Allosaurus, um, even with those longer arms, Allosaurus can't reach its mouth. Um, if it was hunting, it would have to overrun the prey and sort of let it bounce off his chest and <gasps> grab those. Um, and the other thing about arms or any body part is they're expensive, right? It takes energy to make arms, it takes energy to maintain arms. And if you have arms, well, the, they, can, they can be broken, they can go pathological on you, you know, you're not gonna get a disease in a body part that's not there. Makes sense. Um, so there's a cost to everything in 
evolution, and if that cost um, isn't less than the benefit that you're reaping from that, uh, those things go away. So these tiny arms actually make a lot of sense when you look at it that way. They might be the key to the power of, of T-Rex. And there's a great quote uh, that I like by the poet Marge Piercy, and she says that strengths and weaknesses are children of the same womb. Ah, that illustrates it really well. Yeah. Okay, let's say you have a time machine, you go back to the Mesozoic mm -hmm. age, and you're being chased by a T-Rex. How do you escape? Remember guys, this uh, deals with our book giveaway. You could get a free signed copy by Kenneth Akovara. So can you stand still like in Jurassic Park when they're trying not to get eaten by the dinosaurs? T-Rex, we can see from its skull, had really good olfactory senses, a really good smeller. So if you stood still like they do in Jurassic Park, it would smell you like a hound dog and gobble you up like a meat cookie. Oh my gosh, okay, so that's <laughs> not gonna work. Can yeah. you run away from T-Rex? Probably not. Uh, most studies uh, indicate the T-Rex was uh, pretty fast. Uh, some even would say faster than the fastest Olympic sprinter. Um, you're probably not going to outpace a T-Rex. Okay, what if we're by the water? Can I go for a swim? Well, almost every animal can swim, and we have swim tracks from dinosaurs, uh, so it's quite likely that T-Rex could swim. Okay, so what do I do? How do I escape from T-Rex? Well, the one thing about T-Rex that maybe would give you a shred of a chance is that, remember, T-Rex is really long. It's about 45 feet long. That's a telephone pole. Wow. Imagine if you had a telephone pole across your shoulders and tried to turn, right? It would be a really ponderous operation. Mm -hmm. And we humans, we're really good at turning. We're really good at spinning. So what I would do, aside from not go back to the Cretaceous, because you'd probably die, um, would be to do a U-turn, right? Make a quick turn, run the other way. It's probably going to take T-Rex a little while to turn before it chases after you. So make a U-turn back to your time machine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Come back to the present. Yes. Great. And don't forget right. to take some pictures while oh, you're there. Oh, of course. So Might we want to well. know if they have feathers. I'm very curious <laughs> about this. All right, so you've done a lot of work um, of discovering new dinosaur species. Um, Dreadnoughtus, you can see him on the cover of the book. Yeah. Or maybe it's a her. Who knows? We don't know. Yeah. So tell me, how did you find Dreadnoughtus, and where did you find it? Well, I found Dreadnoughtus in southernmost Patagonia, at the bottom of Argentina, near Tierra del Fuego. And um, I found Dreadnoughtus the way all paleontologists find their fossils, is you, you go to a place that has rocks of the right age, depending on what your interests are. Those rocks have to be sedimentary rocks. And then today, it's really helpful if those rocks are exposed in a desert or a badlands kind of an environment. So you get good rates of erosion that are always exposing new bones at the surface. Yeah. If you have those three things, you get yourself on the ground and you walk. And you literally walk until you find a bone sticking out of the rock. And then I always like to add a fourth thing, which is to get as far away from other paleontologists <laughs> as possible. Competition. It's not like I don't like other paleontologists, but when you get yourself um, you know, in an isolated spot, you have a much better chance of finding not only bones, but something that's new to science. And, and those were the conditions uh, when I got on the ground in the location where I found Dreadnoughtus in 2005. Wow. So what's the theory on how this giant dinosaur died? Well, this particular individual, and, and we actually have two Dreadnoughtus specimens. We have one that's a little bit smaller. Um, we can see from the sediments that it was caught up in what we call a crevasse splay. That is that rivers develop natural levees along them. And then during storm events, flood events, those levees can break. And what's ever in the river, the water, the sediment, the logs, the animals, they all get kind of puked out onto the floodplain. And when that happens, that stuff can end up in a very soupy situation, kind of like quicksand. We call it liquefaction. And it appears that, that the dreadnoughtus specimens sank down into the mire very quickly. Oh, perfect for fossilization. Yeah. Um, usually when an animal dies, imagine a dinosaur the size of a house and it keels over and it lands on a hard substrate like a floodplain. Um, it's very flat at that time and very little of its body is in contact with the earth. So it's very difficult for that individual to make the transition from the biosphere to the geosphere before it's weathered away or before scavengers pull it apart. So in that situation with big ones, you typically only find a few bones um, or no bones. In the case of Dreadnoughtus, it sank down and got buried so quickly that one of the thigh bones, the femur of Dreadnoughtus, was actually vertical. I've never seen that before. That's amazing. So it really got sucked into the geosphere really fast. So we, we ended up finding 145 bones of Dreadnoughtus 
um, which makes it the most complete skeleton of any of the supermassive dinosaurs. Right, so compared to other giant titanosaurs, mm -hmm. how many bones have they found for other titanosaurs, just to put it in perspective? Well, um, previous to Dreadnoughtus, the most complete super large dinosaur was one also from Patagonia called Futilocnosaurus. Mm -hmm. um, that was about 26% complete. Dreadnoughtus is over 70% complete. Recently, there was a new titanosaur from northern Patagonia published called uh, Patagotitan. Um, and that is assembled from about six individuals. Um, and that's also a very complete skeleton. I actually haven't seen the percentage number on that yet. Um, but that's a complete one, but from different individuals. So the, you have the confounding effects of you know, knowing the proportions when they come from individuals that are maybe in different growth stages. Wow, so you had a 70% of the titanosaur. Yeah, and that's why it took us uh, five field seasons to excavate Dreadnoughtus, five winters in the Patagonian uh, desert. I spent about, in total, a year in my tent uh, living next to that animal. <laughs> oh man, and I love the story <laughs> about breakfast. Do you want to share that? Uh, oh yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so. Our first field season down in Patagonia, you know, as the expedition leader, I've got to provision the food, and uh, I provision cereal for the crew to eat for breakfast, which seems totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't eat cereal for breakfast in Patagonia because it blows off your spoon before you can eat it. <laughs> so, it's so windy down there. The wind never stops there. It's maddening, and it just... Actually, when the wind stops, everybody kind of stops and looks around like, what's, oh, the wind has stopped. It's, it's actually bizarre when the wind stops. Oh, man. <laughs> so why did you name this Dreadnoughtus? What does that mean? Well, it, it means fears nothing, dread not, and it alludes to the turn of the last century battleships, the dreadnoughts, that were these first big steel warships that were essentially impervious to the pre-existing technology. And, you know, um, I've always thought it a shame that these giant herbivores are, you know, portrayed as these you know, kind of lumbering, dopey herbivores that languish in ponds with, you know, salad hanging out of their mouth, just kind of sitting around waiting for a T-Rex to come take a bite out of them. They weren't like that. If you look at herbivores today, herbivores are mean and they're surly and, and the big ones, they want to kill you. You know, the most dangerous big animal in Africa, it's not a lion or a cheetah, it's the hippo. Oh. Hippos attack people, kill people. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, killed in India every year by elephants. So herbivores are territorial, they're aggressive. Predators actually tend to be very cautious because if you're a cheetah and you break a toe, you're probably going to starve to death. Oh. If you're a water buffalo and you break your leg, you probably hang out with a broken leg and eat grass for a, a good long while. Um, so, you know, can you imagine a 65 ton dreadnoughtus in the breeding season defending a territory? Mm. A terribly fierce creature that you don't want to be anywhere near. Yeah, maybe I'll rethink this time machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> All right, so getting back to the title of your book, mm -hmm. Why Do Dinosaurs Matter? Well, you know, dinosaurs, I think, in the public imagination really stand in for the past, stand in for ancient. And so in the book, you know, it's a book about dinosaurs, but it's also about our discovery of deep time. It's a book about the past. And the past matters because the future matters, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody, I think even paleontologists, are more concerned with the future than we are the past. But we don't have access to the future. Nobody remembers the future. Nobody can do experiments in the future. We can make no observations in the future. And the present is essentially nothing, right? Your question is already in my past. Um, so the past is all we have to base our judgments on and to plot our course into our environmental future. And it was Winston Churchill who said, the further back you look, the further ahead you can see. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to understand how our planet has responded in the past to global warming, to environmental disruptions, to biodiversity crises, to sea level rise, well, that's all happened in the past. This time it's happening, unfortunately, because of humans driving these systems to change. But we have examples of catastrophes in the past. We have examples even of gradual changes in the past. Um, we have examples of great adaptations in organisms that solve problems millions of years ago that humans are still grappling with. And so, you know, it would be foolish and arrogant, I think, to ignore the lessons of the past. So dinosaurs matter because our future matters. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us here at Live Science. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Next time you write a book, you'll have to come back to Live Science. I'll be here. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>